picture of Jesus on there and the cross. Does anyone else remember that? Hey, if you're a teenager, Pastor Brian is here today. Yay, let's give it up for Pastor Brian. He lives. He's not just a rumor, urban legend. He lives. I wanted to give props to all the high schoolers that came to church this morning. Because there was prom last night at Still. And if you're up late, getting your dance on, and got up early and came to church, well, that's a props to you for doing that. That's very cool. All right. How are you guys doing? Okay? It's a little hot in the mic. Can you bring it down just a little bit? It's good to see everyone, by the way. It's good to see y'all. All right. Seven characteristics of strong churches. All right? We want to be flexing it. Mm. We want to be a strong church. Not a weak church, but a strong church. And we've been in Acts 2, 42 through 48, looking at the seven characteristics of strong churches. One is what? Foundation is what? The Word of God. Amen. And what is the second characteristic of strong churches? Koinonia. Fellowship. And who has to have their coin? Does anyone still have their dollar coin? I'm going to be... Let me see your hand if you still have your dollar coin that I passed out. All right, very cool. Do we turn those back in? Or do we still have some of those, Paula? We turned those back in, didn't we? We still have some? Okay. Try to bring those next week. So I did a play on words. Koinonia in the Greek means fellowship. To have in common, to be intimate with God and with each other. And so I gave everyone who was in church for two weeks in a row a one of those new dollar one of those new dollar coins. And it was not to spend on a Coke or a bag of chips. It's not like a fire extinguisher to break in case of emergency. See one when you have those you're at a doctor's appointment. They have the chips machine over there. You're like, man, if I just had three quarters I could get some Pop Tarts. Or a pretzel. Do not use your koinonia coin for that. It's a reminder to have what? Fellowship with God and with each other. Relationship with God and with each other. So we have koinonia with Christ by faith. Okay. You have a relationship with God by Faith, not by works, but by faith in Jesus Christ. His death on the cross and his resurrection. Our relationship with Christ should be first as the priority. And we squeeze our coin in our hand. And we say we must protect our coin in the air. Our fellowship with God is the most important thing in our lives. We protect it with everything that we have. Does that sound better now? I was like in a windstorm before. All right. <clears throat> Sorry. So it is to be first, it's the priority, and then it's to be consistent and constant. We abide in our fellowship, our relationship with Christ. And I use the, the reference in the Old Testament to the city of refuge, that if you murdered someone by accident, you could flee to a city of refuge. And as you remained in the city of refuge, you could not be killed or hurt by the avenger of blood of the person you killed. So if you remained in the city, you were safe. If you went outside of the city, the avenger of blood could kill you. So to remain in Christ, remain in his koinonia, fellowship with him on a constant basis. That is true fellowship and koinonia with God. And next, last week, we learned that koinonia with the church, that we have love one for another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And I said, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. If you don't have love for other believers and you don't want to hang out with other Christians, you might want to check yourself 
and see where you are spiritually. Because Jesus Christ said over and over and over that if you have love one for another, then that confirms that you are a true follower of Jesus Christ. And then Christians, they hung out together in homes. And we hang out in homes. We had a potato bar at our house, at uh, Melody's house last Friday night. That was good. Yummy. I had been eating low carb all week. But Friday night, I was in carb overload. It was great. <laughs> potato, bacon. Mm. Christians love to eat. And we know, love to hang out. Christians in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, in the New Church, they hung out every day with each other, building each other up, having this true family dynamic. Then they take care of each other. They sold their possessions. And we say Christianity is not communism. Communism says, and socialism says, what's yours is mine. We'll take your stuff and spread it around to us. But Christianity says, hey, what's mine is yours. I love Jesus and I love you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. So we will have this sharing and taking care of each other's needs. And I said we could do that by giving up our time to serve one another, our talents, our abilities to teach and to serve and to encourage one another. We build each other in koinonia and then uh, treasures as we share our money, our coins, to, to help feed the poor and to help take care of those who serve us. I just want to give props to you guys. We have taken care of a lot of families in our church and in the community. And we were able to do that because what? You gave of your time, your talents, and your treasures. You gave of your money. And we were able to help people in our communities. We've given away thousands of dollars over the last couple of years to help people in our church and in our communities. So that's what true Christianity looks like. Koinonia, intimacy, to have in common. Okay, so we take care of each other. Now today I want to look at barriers to koinonia. Okay? God has called us to have fellowship one with another, to love one another, to build up one another, hasn't he? It's right there in the scriptures. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Look in your Bibles, or you can look on the screen if you don't have a Bible. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Timothy, Peter, James, uh, excuse me, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. Let's pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we start into your word this morning that you would come and convict us of sin and righteousness. I pray that you would bring comfort, that you would show us where, where the barriers in our lives are to koinonia with you and to one another. <coughs> Father, I ask you to be glorified through our church. Continue to help us to, to grow and to reach lost people and see young people and young Christians discipled and to grow in your word. I ask, Father, that um, you would, you would he bring healing and you would bring just a sense of peace and encouragement to the body of Christ in Church Cibolo this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, let's look at verse 23. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. Okay? Let's hold tightly without wavering, perseverance, to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Ladies, can you trust your husbands to do the dishes when he says he's going to do them? every time can you trust your husband to give the kids a bath at the right time they're not keeping him up late 
playing around on a school night. I don't know anything for my wife, so I can't really say she's pretty good at stuff, but she's not perfect. I can't always trust her on some things. <laughs> Any kids in here? <laughs> But can you, can, you, can you trust your boss to give you that raise, that promotion that they promised you? You know how many times I've heard people say, I was promised a raise and a promotion, and after working five years for the company, they never got it, right? You can't trust in corporations. You can't trust in people. But who can we trust in this morning? Right here in verse 23. For God can be trusted, what? To keep his promise. To keep his promises of the new covenant. God keeps his promises. No matter what they are, no matter where you are in your life, you can always trust God's promises. When your life is going great, it's easier to trust your promises maybe sometime. When your life is down here, sometimes it's a little bit harder. God, are you going to come through this for me? You said that if I followed you and I put you first, that you would meet my needs. And it's not happening right now. So your word says it, God. So let's make it happen. When are you going to make it happen? Your new covenant promises says that you would give me a new heart. That you would cause me to have victory over sin. I'm not experiencing that right now. So God, I believe your promises. I trust them. Make them happen in me. God always keeps his promises. You can count on that. Okay? Always, always, always trust and believe God's promises because he will keep his promises. Now, it's not always in the way I think they should happen. It's not always in the way that I believe they will happen, but God always keeps his promises. I can testify to that personally. God keeps his promises. And it's really cool when God keeps his promises in a way that you've never seen coming. A provision. I don't know if you... Uh, I've told this story maybe once before, but I'll share it again. Lisa, my wife, was laid off by HP after the 9-11 deal and the economy kind of went down. Hewlett Packard had their first layoff. And Lisa was... She was doing great at her job, but her job went away. We had a house payment and three little babies five, three, and one, or less than one. And I was going to seminary and working at a church and not making much money at the time. And uh, so I like, man, how are we going to keep our house? How are we going to feed our kids? And so they gave Lisa a what? One of those um, packages when you leave, right? Yeah, severance package. And so we're, we cut the cable. We cut... A lot of stuff. And then three, four months came by. She didn't get a job. I, I couldn't start a new job. And that last week, I'm like, man, that's the last mortgage payment we can make. And I'm desperate. And I get on my knees and says, God, here in Matthew 6.33, it says, Seek you first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Housing, clothing, food. Okay? God, we're seeking you first. We know your word made a promise. I don't know how you're going to do it, but we need your help. I don't have enough for the mortgage and, and for food, so I'll just pay the mortgage first and see what comes around. Little old lady. Our, our house is right here on the corner lot. She lived right there with her, with her kids. She came across the yard and she had a giant box in her hand. I'm telling you, God keeps his promises. And it rings the doorbell. I go to the front door. Hey, you know what? 
I just felt like God told me to bring you this steaks. My brother is a, he's a big time cattle rancher. And we have all this steak that can't even go in our freezer. Would you like the rest of it? I'm like, woo, praise God, yes. <laughs> not only, I'm not eating beans and rice, I'm eating steak. I'm eating so much steak, it's coming out of my ears. How do you want your steak tonight? How do you like your prime rib? How do you like your, your New York strips? God keeps his promises. And sometimes it's at the last moment he comes in and just boom, blows you away. I'll never forget it. And guess what God was building in me? Faith. I don't doubt God anymore. He keeps his promises. Okay. Because this, we're going to come back to God keeps his promises. All right. We're going to come back to this a little bit later as we move forward. Let us think of ways. Oh, let me finish this story. Okay. We got the food. All right. I'll come back to this. God keeps his promises. I got the little Bible story thing that we give away to all our kids, right? And so we did the, uh, the walls of Jericho. The story in the Old Testament that God said, you will take the city of Jericho by simply marching around the city of Jericho and on the seventh day, uh, you walk seven days and you blow the trumpet and the walls will fall down and you'll take Jericho. Now that's craziness, okay? But God made his promise. He said it. We'll do it. We couldn't sell our house. We're going, we felt called, and God called us to Colorado to, to do church planting in Colorado Springs. And we couldn't leave until our house sold. And, and you know, all this stuff was happening. And so I just felt like God said, you know what? Let's march around. Let's march around this, the inside of our house, around this dining room table, and see what happens. And we'll pray and march around this table as a family. So he got up. And we marched around our table in our house. Believing. Believing. God promises we're going to sell our house. God, and we have faith. We have faith as a child. We're going to, God, sell our house. You can do it. Then a week, our house sold. I didn't do seven times because I was getting a little dizzy. I get motion sickness unless I have the patch on. And it's not a nicotine patch, smart Alex. It's a motion sick patch. I put that on my back, my uh, nicotine patch. God sold our house. He gave us food to eat. He kept his promises to us. God provides. And I know many of you have the same stories as well. God can be trusted to keep his promises. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. So as Christians, let us think of ways to motivate one another. You ever get lazy in your Christian life? This is why we have koinonia. That's why we hang out together, to encourage one another. Don't you just love guy or gal? You meet them, and within five minutes of talking to them, you're ready to tackle the world. I love that. That's what Christianity is about, and that's what we should do for each other. Just hanging out together with my boys and my girls, I get pumped up. I'm ready to go preach. I'm ready to go reach, teach, and help people in Jesus' name. This is what church is all about. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts, right, to obedience of love and good works. And here it is. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. What does it say here? Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. 
But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near and Christ can return at any time. Right here. Do not neglect meeting together as Christians. Black and white. Cornelia is a gift from God. It is a blessing from God. Hey, when you believe in the Lord, I remember the day, got saved, born again, the Holy Spirit living inside of me, I'm changed. And now I have Cornelia with the Father. And then I meet with other cool Christian people. And the Holy Spirit starts this dynamic. That is a gift from God to you and to me. Don't neglect the gift of the Holy Spirit in Koinonia that God has created for the church. What a gift. What a blessing. You're missing out if you're not hanging out with other Christians. It's not a pity party. I don't see to get together and have a pity party about how the economy stinks and... Uh, this president and that president and the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Forget all that. God's on his throne. Who can we go reach in the storm? That's what I'm talking about. Not pity parties, not selfish things, but how can we encourage each other and reach the world for Christ? That is koinonia. It is a gift from God. Now, I'm, I'm, I could preach for an hour and a half on this. Really could. So good. But I won't. And you're like, amen. <laughs> now, it is a gift from God. Can you see it? Fellowship with each other is a gift from God. Now, because fellowship koinonia lifts us up and it encourages us and it makes us strong. It makes us be able to stand against temptation. It makes us be able to stand against the enemy as we kneel to God and pray and as we have fellowship with God and one another. It makes us strong. It makes us happy and full of joy. And it makes us infectious. And other people love our joy and they want to be around us and hang out with us. What's different about you? Oh man, let me tell you about my Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what church is. That's what koinonia is. That's what life group's about. That's what meeting together on Sunday mornings is about. Now, there's a dude in the Bible. His name is Satan or the devil. You know that he hates God? He hates God with all of his being. He is so full of pride. He thought he could ascend to the heavens. Dude, you were created by God. You're not a God. And so he was cast out of God's presence. Him and all of his stupid angel buddies that thought they could do a coup against God. You're created. God could snuff you out in a minute. So he hates God. And guess what? He hates God's people. If you're here and you don't follow Jesus Christ, the one thing he wants you not to do is follow Jesus Christ. He'll do everything in his being to keep you from becoming a Christian. Now, once you trust in Jesus and you're born again, now what is his goal? To keep you from reaching other people. Now he wants to keep you from this beautiful thing called koinonia or fellowship. If I can't save you, if I can't keep you from being saved, now I want to keep you from this blessing. He doesn't want you to get it your birthday gift. He's over there in the corner at the birthday party and he's jealous. And he's like, man, this guy is too happy. Maybe if I can steal his present, his gift. Look, his dad gave him a, a, a coin. It's koinonia and it's worth millions of dollars. And I don't want him to have that coin. Let me steal that coin from him. That koinonia. That old snake in the grass. He hates you. He wants to rob you of your koinonia with God and then with each other. So let's talk about the koinonia we have with each other. Turn to me in your Bibles to 1 Peter 5.8. 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5.8. Go to the right. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. 
You're like, man, it's on the screen. Why come you're not using it? Well, we've got a bunch of new Christians in here, and I don't want them to learn the word, how to find the Bible verses. They're like, man, my phone's right here. I can just scroll right to it. First Peter 5, eight. Stay alert. Be on guard. Like a sentry on a battlefield. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. Okay? There is no symbolism in this verse. Evil is not personified in the word devil or Satan. No, he's real. It's black and white. This is straight up. This isn't figurative language. This isn't image. Here, this is real. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil, and his, and his followers. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Devour. Stand firm against him. Be strong in your faith, remembering that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. There is suffering persecution. But he says, stay alert. Watch out for the great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. It has been my experience as a pastor in Colorado and Texas, in Frisco, Plano, Texas, and Colorado Springs, and now San Antonio. You know what the one thing Satan does to devour Christians? Isolate them from other Christians. It's one of the main tactics of the enemy. Have you anyone ever watched the special on lions on National Geographic? It's pretty awesome. These dudes use blitzes. Depending on who the enemy is, they'll form like a lion or five or seven lions. They will blitz an enemy. They will flank an enemy. Like there's a watering hole and they come down to drink the water. There'll be two here. They'll drive them toward the other ones and pounce and kill someone. The ambush. The isolation. You know the isolation is when they distract the mama giraffe over here and then someone comes in, the little baby is over here isolated by itself. They come in and drag the baby off and kill it and eat it. The same thing, the same imagery. As Christians, if you're with the herd, you're with the pack, we are strong. But if you're isolated from the pack where Satan wants you, you will be pounced upon he will eat you alive. And that's a problem. Koinonia is a gift from God and Satan wants to take it from you. He wants to keep you from it. Okay? Next slide. Now, barriers to koinonia in your life, fellowship with other Christians. Let's talk about this. I, I talked in length, in length to a few people this week about Koinonia and fellowship. And I'm drawing from my past experiences as pastor at other churches as well. One of the things that can rob you of your koinonia with other Christians is your past. Okay? Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Go back to the left. To Philippians 3. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Y'all know my little saying for, to remember Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Gentiles eat pork chops. Okay? That's how I remember it. And what a great day it was when God said, Hey, kill and eat, Peter. There's bacon over there for you. No hugging at church. No touching. Pants are falling down. Hopefully that means I'm losing weight. Your 
your past, what your parents taught you. Okay, next. What was happened to you, right? I think the percentage I heard was half of the ladies in America are sexually abused and molested. That's a shame. That's terrible. And a lot of times, Satan will try to rob these ladies and men who've been molested from, from true Christian koinonia with God and with each other by tripping us up by the past, what has happened to you, what is happening to us. But God says, don't, let, don't look back to those terrible things that happened to you. Look forward to the, to the prize that lies ahead, eternal life, koinonia, fellowship with one another. I believe that you find healing and you can find healing from the past by hanging out with Christians. I've seen it happen. The Holy Spirit is there. When two or three Christians gather together, the Holy Spirit is there in the middle. He's here this morning. In Shirts, Texas. The Holy Spirit brings healing. And you find encouragement when you hang out with other Christians. Maybe you find another lady at your church that's been through the same abuse. Maybe you find another man whose daddy emotionally abused him. And you can talk your... I know it's feelings, guys, but come on. We can talk about that a little bit. And then we can shoot guns or something. I'm not, talk, I'm not saying give up your man card. I'm saying just be honest and hang out with other dudes or other Christians. And God can bring healing. He will bring healing. And Satan knows that, so he wants to isolate you by using your past. How your parents modeled bad behaviors. You know, I met a family in Colorado Springs where the husband had thrown the daughter across the room and when they were younger, I mean like two or three years younger, and broke her leg. Okay? And then there were, she started coming to our church and, and then the husband had just slapped her and beat her up, right? And I'm a youth pastor and this is, this is the first case my pastor ever gave me. Oh yeah, since she's a youth, you need to deal with this family. And I'm like, dude, I don't know what to do. I felt really out of my comfort zone dealing with this. But when she told me, oh, my husband slapped me, he beat me up last week. I'm like, why? What happened? All right. And the little daughter said that he, uh, she was like 12 or 13. She had beat him. She had beat her that week. Not given a spanking. Okay, there's a difference between a, a whooping and a spanking and a beating. Okay, she got a beating. Couldn't sit down. You know what the mom told the daughter? Just keep it quiet. Don't tell anyone. You'll draw too much attention to yourself. And to the, I'm like, that's the opposite of what the Bible says. It says sin, darkness should come into the light. And Satan wants to keep us from that by what? Sometimes what our parents have taught you. What has happened to you in your past. Okay? But don't let him rob you of that. Of course, I called the cop on that dude. <laughs> and he was sitting in his butt in jail. But guess what? The guy got saved. In prison. <laughs> See how God works that out? This guy hit rock bottom. bottom. Maybe someone messed him up in prison. I don't know. But he got saved. But don't, and what I'm, the whole point of that story is this. Don't let what your parents have modeled you, if it goes against Scripture, okay? You model and you follow Scripture. Not the bad, some bad things our parents have talked to us. So what's the solution to this? Accept your new identity in Christ. 
You are now a child of God and He calls you to become a part of His church family. When you trust in Jesus Christ, you're now a part of God's family. My identity is in Christ Jesus. I don't have to live the old way that was taught to me by the world or my family. I have a new identity in Christ. I'm his son. I'm his daughter. And I will obey God's word and I will not forsake the assembling of myself together. I will hang out with other Christians. Even though everything in my past, everything in my emotions say not to, I will obey God's law because of my new identity in Christ and I want to follow him and his word. That is the solution to me. God's word says hang out together. I'm going to hang out together. And I want all the benefits and all the blessings God has promised to me as a child of Christ. Okay, next. Your past. Next is your pride. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. How can your pride keep you from hanging out with other Christians? Okay, I'll tell you what I hear right here on the board. Uh, listen to your ego will lead you to uh, isolation. And it says, next one please. I can handle this on my own. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to hang out with other dudes. Hey, I got it all covered. I am good to go. I am the poster boy for Christianity. And I don't need to hang out with others. Right? I'm strong. I got this. Yeah? That giraffe thought they got this too. There was, this, there was this giraffe in this film I was watching last week. And a giraffe can keep lions at bay. I, could, I, I didn't know that. They're giant legs. One kick to the head can kill a lion. I mean, that's how big they are. They're strong. So this one prideful giraffe said, I'll just go out on my own away from the pack, away from the herd. And guess what happened? He got out there at night, all alone. Giraffe's eyes aren't good at the night. Got out there out of the plains and into this rocky area where their legs don't stand. So this giraffe who thought he was big and bad found himself in a pickle. And that's what happens to Christians. When you think, or if you think that you, you got this by yourself, you're going to fall. The lions will come and eat you up. You can only battle in the flesh by yourself for so long. We battle together as a church, as a family of God. We, we're in ranks together. There is protection in numbers. Spiritual protection. And if we hang out with other Christians, we come into the sheepfold. We're, in the, we're under the the help of the great shepherd who is our protector and then we have other Christians to help us in those times of need. So don't let your pride keep you from koinonia. Don't let your past keep you from koinonia. They will lead to isolation and you will be what? Eaten up. Next one. Another barrier to koinonia with other Christians. Oh sorry. So the solution to this. This is simple. This is basic Christianity. Realize that you're incapable of having abundant life apart from Christ, His work, and His church. Realize that you're incapable of winning spiritual battles on your own, that you need God's help. Humility is the, the start to the great Christian life. It is the gateway to God's grace. James 4, 6. I say it often, and I will keep saying it. God resists the proud, but what? He gives grace, power, help, to the humble. Next, your priorities. Work and extracurricular activities. Okay? Your priorities will isolate you from the body of Christ. I know this. I have three daughters 13, 11, 9. Soccer, swimming, track dance club hip hop dancing little ballerina dancing 
They're so cute. Satan distracts us and isolates us through wrong priorities. If you isolate yourself and your family too long from, the, from other Christians and the Word of God and from Christ, you will isolate yourself and your little ones and you will be susceptible to attack. Okay? Solution? Ask Christ to bring your priorities into alignment with his will for you. Okay? As simple as this. If you're doing too much, if Christ is the last thing in your life, and you are separated and isolated from the church, then you're doing too much. Okay? I'm not going to preach on this, but just let the Holy Spirit guide you in your priorities. If it robs you of your koinonia, it's a barrier and you need to get rid of it. Okay, next, your sin. Your sin will lead you to isolation, okay? Next, just, your sin will keep you in the dark. Uh, John 3.20, all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for their sins will be exposed. You ever been to church and you're like, man, I don't want to go back to that, that church. Man, that church is, that church is to this, that church is to that. The preacher is to this and maybe... Yeah. Maybe it's not the church. Maybe it's me. <laughs> Maybe it's sin in my own life that's keeping me from koinonia. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to go to church where a man preaches and teaches the Bible. Especially if I'm living in sin. Our sin will isolate us from Christ. And from the body of Christ, the solution Confess your sins and start living in the light of God's promises to live in Koinonia. Okay, I had a, you had a tough week. Don't let it just keep dragging you down and down and down. Just confess your sins. Move on in the fellowship with other believers. We're a family. We accept each other back. We encourage each other. We forgive each other. As Christ forgives you, we forgive you. And we live in harmony together. Look at these barriers of, in your life. Don't let Satan rob you and isolate you from Christ by those barriers. Next slide, please. Okay, now the church. Koinonia is inclusive, not exclusive. Everyone who walks in the door, your neighbors, your church, you know what? We used to use the empty chair, okay, at Life Group. This empty chair and the empty chairs around you represent all those other people that need Jesus Christ. Christianity is inclusive, not exclusive. It's, it's not for the rich. It's not for the poor. It's for everyone. It's not for different colored people. It's for everyone. It's not for those who have the appearance of godliness and, and not for those who, who are just a gruff. It's for everyone. Koinonia is for everyone in the church and everyone is invited to our home. Everyone is invited to our church. Next. Okay. We block Koinonia as a church. We block and keep other people from church in a relationship with God when we are self-centered. When we come in and we say, oh, it's all about me. It's all about us. And we exclude everyone else around us. All these people God would have for us to reach. When we are self-centered, it blocks koinonia in their life. Because when people come into church, they have questions, they have needs, they have hurts, and it's our job to reach them and to reach out to them. But if we're self-centered, oh, it's about me, what I can do, what I can get, it excludes other people and it blocks other me. It's all about us. And we exclude everyone else around us. All these people God would have for us to reach. When we are self-centered, it blocks koinonia in their life. Because when people come into church, they have questions, they have needs, they have hurts, and it's our job to reach them and to reach out to them. But if we're self-centered, oh, it's about me, what I can do, what I can get, it excludes other people and it blocks others from koinonia. So I got a two-strand thing here. Personal, what's my barrier 
what Satan uses as my barrier to keep me from cornelia. And then now I'm looking at things in the church, things in my life that may keep others from cornelia, that are blocking others out. Satan wants to get you off track and he wants to keep three to five other people from Christ and from Koinonia. I say I'm not going to let him do that in my life. I want to be a gateway to Koinonia, not a barrier to God's grace and his mercy. So when we're man-centered, when we're selfish, when we're condemning of other people. Remember we just talked about sin? Some brother or sister caught in sin and they come back to God and they confess and they, they are repenting we don't 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 come to your life group and they share something they did and don't be all condemning and judging of them because when you do that that blocks God's healing in their life that blocks koinonia in their life a church that operates under condemnation and judging no one will want to go there and if they do they they will be jacked up God brings freedom. He brings healing. And we as a church will block others from Christ and Koinonia. If we're man-centered, self-centered, if we're condemning, if we gossip, okay? Gossip in the church is huge. It is a huge barrier to Koinonia. Why, why would I share with you something that's internal and something that I'm dealing with if you gossip and share it with other people? Don't do that. Remember that I talked about the guy and we laughed? Hey, don't come near me. Don't. And then eventually, they read the word and they let their guard down. And they share something with you. And then you go and share that with someone else. You just crush them. And they will never, they will keep for the rest of their lives, they will keep this arm's distance away from you and other Christians. Because what? We gossiped. We were self-centered. We were man-centered. Let that not be said of us. Last. So church, condemning, when we gossip, when we have selfishness. Is there one more? Okay, that's it. May it never be said of our church that we block other people from God's presence in his koinonia. Don't let Satan use your past your sin, your pride to keep you from the gift of acquainting you with God and with one another. Okay? Let's all stand and pray and we'll be done. Churches aren't perfect. We're all fallen. We all make mistakes. And there's no perfect church. And they say if you go to that church, you better leave. Because you just messed it up. We're not a perfect church. But man, we can be a healing church. We can be a church of koinonia. By letting other people into our lives. And into the fellowship we have with one another. I had something to say. Yes. The promise of Koinonia, the blessing of Koinonia with God and each other is for you. And if you believe God's promises and you obey his promises and you step forward in faith, the risk outweighs the, the reward outweighs the risk. I know there's a chance you could be hurt at church. Others can hurt you and you will be hurt and we hurt each other. But the rewards of Koinonia far outweigh the risks. And if you, I'm just saying right now, I don't know what's going on, but if you've been hurt by church in the past, if you've been hurt by other Christians or someone in this church, I pray that you would get that right with them. Because sometimes I hurt people and I don't even know it. I'm just a stupid dude sometimes, you know? We need to forgive each other. 
We need to have a church in a spirit of oneness in Koinonia. May we forgive each other and move forward in this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to pray right now for all those people and myself and everyone in here who's ever been abused, molested, verbally abused by their parents or other people or made fun of in their past. I pray that, and I stand against Satan right now in the power of the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit that, Father, you would stand and they would believe at this moment that that should have no more effect in their life. I pray that they would not be tripped up by the past, what people have said in the past, by their pride or any sin in their life. May Satan not be able to rob them of the joy of cornelia, intimacy with God and with each other as a church. I pray for healing of people's lives. I pray for, for true miracles. I pray for a spirit of grace and forgiveness in our church. I pray that we will be known by our love. When people look at and hear about our church, they will at least know that we're not perfect, but we're a church who loves God and we're passionate about God and we love people and we love one another. That will be the greatest display of true Christianity. In short, Sibylla, Father, continue to bring those to our church, our lives, who you want to see get saved, to those you want to join in true Cornelia. We want to honor you through our lives and our church. We love you so much. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.